where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. The world is much different now than in 1834, when Hartford Seminary first opened to train men to become religious leaders. Back then it was called the Theological Institute of Connecticut. Now, 187 years later, it has a new name, the Hartford International University for Religion and Peace. Today, where we live, we hear from its president, Joel Lohr, about how the institution has adapted over the years to serve its multi-faith students and the work that remains. Are you an alum? You can join us. You can share a comment on our Facebook page or find us on Twitter at Where We Live. Coming up, we hear from other faculty members and a current student. But first on Zoom is Joel Lohr, again, president of Hartford International University for Religion and Peace. Joel, welcome to the show. Good morning. Really great to be here this morning. I mentioned that the history of the school goes back to uh, 1834. It's a really interesting history. Could you tell us briefly about that time? Sure. As you've already mentioned, 1834, um, it actually started as an offshoot of Yale Divinity School over a theological difference. And that's something we can talk about today. Theological differences, something that we uh, still work on today. Uh, started in 1834, training men. And part of the interesting history, I often think about Hartford as this incredible place. Um, but yeah, the first seminary in the country in 1889, not too long after that, to welcome women to study here at Hartford Seminary, what was then Hartford Seminary. So I always ask myself, what is it about Hartford, this unique city that nowhere else in the country could a woman study to, uh, theological studies in seminary, but right here in Hartford? Um, so we have this long history, 1889, and around that same time, and this is key to our, our future and who we are today, around that same time, there was a professor here named Duncan Black McDonald, who was very interested in Islam and uh, started teaching Arabic to students because he felt very strongly that at that time, good Christian ministers needed to know something about Islam and the people that they were encountering in the, uh, encountering in the mission fields. So I can say more. There's a long history here. We've evolved over time into the Hartford Seminary Foundation. And then very recently, we changed our name. But that's a whole long process, but a very exciting one and uh, really sets us well into our future and our mission. So a pioneering uh, institution uh, here in our state, uh, the former name Hartford Seminary, when people hear that, they might associate that just with the, the Christian faith. But as you mentioned, uh, Hartford, uh, now Hartford International University, uh, you're serving multi-faith students. And so what is your current student body look like? Yeah, a really unique place in so many ways. And I use that word unique carefully, having lived in England where they made it very clear. You can't use that word unless you're the only one. Um, I think we're probably one of the only, if not the only institution where you have roughly 45, I think 43% this year of our students identify as Muslim. Um, that goes back to that long history I mentioned of Duncan Black McDonald, but also our um, insistence uh, early in the 90s even that um, Islam should be taught not by Christians only but should be taught by good scholars uh, who identify within the tradition itself um, and so to this day we have many Muslim faculty members and hired the first Muslim faculty member of any seminary in our country and in the um, student body with roughly 40, 45, numbers fluctuate a little bit year to year. Muslim students, um, about 40% would identify Christian, and then the remaining 20%, just to kind of even it out, um, would remain or would identify uh, as religious others. Jewish is really important part of our identity today, the Abrahamic religious traditions, as they're often called, but also any, you know, we have non-religious students studying with us, um, Hindu, Buddhist, and so on. And so getting back to the name change, I understand this was part of a, at least a two-year strategic uh, planning process, but what was the feedback that you heard from your interfaith community about the name and the reasons why it needed to be changed? Yeah, it's interesting. I'll, I'll try not to share too much because it was a long, it was a two-year process, but the truth is it's really been a 40-year process. Um, when we moved out of the really beautiful historic stone Gothic buildings that we used to live in that are now the Yukon Law School right here in the west end of Hartford, right next door to us, um, there was a decision made at that time to, although they kept the name Hartford Seminary, they chose to um, refocus their energies into religion research. And so we started the Hartford Institute for Religion Research, which is a very active and thriving group, much like Pew that studies congregational 
um, life, and we just received a $5 million grant to continue that for uh, understanding the, the, uh, how COVID and the current pandemic is affecting religious congregations. We moved out of those buildings in 1980, roughly, into this new building, on, uh, which is now our campus. We have still a number of other buildings, but part of that, we never really changed the name to match our new mission. And we stopped the largely residential ordination program, which many associate with seminaries, called the Master of Divinity program. That was That's the bread and butter of almost every seminary in the country today. And we stopped that program in the 1980s, but we never really changed the name. And I like to say that although I've been tasked with the hard challenge of, of renaming the institution, in many ways, the process started almost 40 years ago to reimagine ourselves uh, as a new place for religious understanding and to really tackle religious strife. I mean, if you are out there today, I would not be surprised if you are someone who associates the word with religion or the word religion with strife or conflict and with good reason. And uh, so we we have long been committed to uh, those conversations, to dialogue, to exploring the differences that divide people of faith and non-faith or those who don't identify with faith. And so our name change was part of this process when I came to be the new president in 2018 after the 18 year tenure of Heidi Hadsell, who started our peace building program in 2004. Um, it, was, it was, you know, with the new energy, I guess I had coming in, the board looked to me and said, we need to look at this name. Um, so often when I would travel, just one quick example, when I was traveling through Indonesia um, in Singapore, I remember, you know, I had all these beautiful, you know, stops at universities to tell them about our programs. We have a PhD program, which many Indonesians send students for uh, too. Uh, the, the long running joke, but it's, it really is true that we're better known in Indonesia than we are in Hartford. Uh, it, it really played out there. They treated us so kindly. They loved hearing about us. But it was interesting when I would give the talk about what we do in peace building and interreligious understanding in the study of Islam and Judaism, they, they in our religious studies and research, they all looked at me and said, that doesn't sound like a seminary. In Indonesia, the word seminary means training priests. And I thought to myself, you know, that's what it means in the USA too. I really need to look at this with our board. And so the board charged me with this task. And, and the result was Hartford International University for religion and peace. We didn't want to use the word of. We're well aware that we're not necessarily there or arrived, but we really want to be a place that's for something, a place, we see that word as an action word, a place that's for uh, religion and peace and tackling our world's problems head on. You're hearing Joel Lohr here on Where We Live, again, president of Hartford International University for Religion and Peace, formerly known as Hartford Seminary. If you're an alum, if you have a connection with this institution, we'd love to hear from you. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. You know, Joel, we all know that change is hard, and I'm wondering what your the response has been from alum of this institution. And again, when we talked earlier a little bit about religious strife and people's uh, perceptions of religion, you know, how you're working uh, to uh, bring people together to better understand uh, different faiths, different cultures. Can you talk more about that? I certainly can. Thanks, Lucy. I, I feel like I'm the bad student or the student that uh, when we give them a prompt for an essay and they don't answer the question, I find myself marking it saying, answer the question. Um, please answer the question. And you ask me, how did they respond? And I didn't. Um, the response has been overwhelmingly positive. Uh, if I'm honest, I expected, given the, the length of time that we have been called Hartford Seminary, our long history, we have had name changes. As you mentioned, we were called the Theological Institute of Connecticut when we first started. Uh, the Pastoral Union was a name that was used for a time, uh, the Connecticut Pastoral Union. Um, so I really expected I would be spending most of my time after October 13th when we renamed the institution sort of helping people understand the name, the process, uh, dealing with complaints, or at least, you know, can, if, if you don't appreciate the name, can you at least respect where we're going? We've had virtually no uh, pushback on this. So many people have reached out to me personally as part of our event, but uh, that when we launched the name, but also um, after the announcements have gone out with almost, you know, unanimous praise. I Really, there has been no pushback. It's been exciting for people. Um, our international students in particular, when they hear the word international in the name, and we, you know, we know the name is long. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, we're all getting used to it here. We use the acronym HIU to help us at times. It's a long name, but it also really signifies important things. And we, we kept thinking about, are we Hartford or are we the International Institute? Or are we an American you know, University for Peace? We had all these names. We really worked through a lot of, we had a, a consultant help us with some analysis. 
And so words like international are very intentional. Many of our students come from around the globe to study Islamic studies, Jewish studies, Christian studies, especially the intersection of these and how they can live together in peace and work for peace. And now our international peace building program, which I believe you'll hear from a student later in the show. But um, so the word international, we've had international students say to me, thank you, President Laura, for you know, this new name. Uh, I feel like I'm so much more part of this institution with the word international, or I've had PhD students say to me, um, thank you. This is so much easier to explain to my friends in, in Singapore or elsewhere that I've gotten a PhD from a university rather than a seminary. And so we have shoes to fill. We're, we're growing into our aspirations. But, you know, we've used this title. Interesting. And then I'll get your next question, I'm sure. But um, we've used the words university of religion for a long time, dating back to the 1930s, 40s, 50s. Our tagline here, if you look at our old letterhead, was a university of religion, Hartford Seminary Foundation a university of religion. We've long been a place that's wrestled with our identity. We're not a usual place. We're really a, a unique theological and religious, interreligious institution in our country and indeed, uh, I would say, the world. Mm. Uh, Joel, when we talk about a religion, especially in this country, you know, the views of religion and faith have changed. And when you contrast that to uh, some of the, the cultures you mentioned abroad, uh, I'm looking at a, a survey that Pew did in 2019 uh, that uh, the people with no affiliation is a growing group of individuals in our country. Uh, Pew saying the religiously unaffiliated share of the population consisting of people who describe their religious identity as atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular now stands at 26%. Uh, that's up from 17% back in 2009. And so what do you see your role in terms of uh, talking about faith and religion in, in our country where uh, people may be tending uh, to to move away from uh, the beliefs that they were raised on. Um, just curious your thoughts on that. Absolutely. I, I'm not in the business of trying to convince people otherwise. I can understand the move away from organized religion when you look at some of the um, strife and politics and problems we've seen locally, domestically, internationally. Um, we, we often in, in the religious uh, research world, we call those who identify with no religious tradition or, you know, don't either don't check a box or, or check, check the, the box that says none, um, the nuns or the N-O-N-E-S, not the N-U-Ns. Um, they're a growing group. Um, they, although the numbers do seem to actually be pulling back a little bit, but not by much. You, you're right, the numbers are quite strong. Um, I, I saw an interesting study recently, I don't have the reference in front of me, about our younger generation, Generation Z or Generation Z, for those Canadians out there, which I'm one, um, that they that many people still do appreciate religious rituals, uh, spiritual beliefs, but choose not to be associated. Even young evangelicals would, would um, prefer not to be associated with organized religion. Uh, I think there are many good reasons for that and understandable reasons, even while everyone has a stake in the questions of religion today, the non-religious as well as the religious. If we can't learn to get along, you know, we use a line here very often, I can't take credit for it, it's Hans Kuhn, a Swiss theologian that said, there'll be no peace in our world until there's peace among the religions. And there'll be no peace among the religions until there's dialogue between the religions. Uh, we would add that there will be no dialogue between religions until there are friendships between people of different faiths and different religions. Uh, these questions that we are working on, that we care so deeply about, they are not easy questions. You know, Ibu Patel has often said, you know, interfaith isn't rocket science. Uh, it's harder. Uh, it does take hard work and smart thinking to work through some of these complex problems. These are issues, you know, the values we hold that are often linked to religion, Sometimes our beliefs that we may not even realize are tied to religious traditions, how, you know, how justice is meted out. All these things are tied to religious, often tied to religious traditions. And the more we can do to understand those things um, and to talk about them intelligently, but also respectfully. And I don't think we have much, uh, I can, you know, when I look, look around me, what we're doing isn't working. Um, we don't have a lot of respect uh, for each other. And we would say that the diversity work, the important DEI work, diversity, equity, and inclusion work, if it doesn't include religious identity or those values and, and truths or those things that people hold so deeply, those things that go all the way down, um, we, you know, I just think those things are going to be superficial and not be as deep and as uh, meaningful and, and successful as we hope they might be. So um, I'll pause there, but there's, yeah, there's a lot more to say on that. 
Oh, I'd love to hear more, uh, Joel, when I think about, again, uh, Hartford International University, uh, uh, the focus on higher learning and this interreligious dialogue. Uh, coming up, we'll hear more about this inaugural peace building uh, program. But when we think about, as you mentioned, diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI, religion is often left out of those discussions. And so I think uh, as we look forward uh, to uh, your institution and um, how it's uh, adapted and evolved, part of that is doing more thoughtful DEI work, helping other uh, workplaces and other organizations think about religion, making it more inclusive. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so so important, and I think that you know religion is you know what are the two things you shouldn't talk about religion and politics. It's a lot easier not to have to talk about religion or to keep it private. Um, so many people in our country, especially those who are come out of maybe Christian, especially Protestant cr traditions, would say things like, "Well, I think we should keep religion a private matter. Why do we need to bring that up in the workplace or in these discussions? Um, those those are private things. You know, it's not. Let's not let it interfere. The religion talking about religion just leads to conflict. And but we would, you know, the interesting thing is, in some ways that comes from a place of privilege to be able to say that faith is a private thing, and even to use the word faith. If you think of the Protestant Reformation, that really. Uh, Martin Luther talked about faith as being the guiding principle of, of what Christianity is. That's kind of colored or, you know, look, made, made these discussions around religion think that you can just talk about uh, rituals and religious ideas as just about faith. And that's something you can keep private. Not everyone can keep things private. If you think of the, um, the, the maybe the young Muslim woman who wears a hijab, has a head covering, uh, that's not private anymore. Or you think of those who have food, uh, maybe are Jewish students or Jewish workplaces that have um, food needs. They can't participate fully in the in the life of the workplace. Um, maybe as a Muslim man, you, you're you're fat or Muslim woman, you're fasting for Ramadan. Um, that affects your workplace. You might not want that bottle of wine that your boss gave you for you know Christmas or for the holiday party. Um, so we, we think that the you know the, the questions of religion are really important. How do we do this intelligently um, as part of this the DEI space? Um, it, it's it's hard work. We're not, you know, but we have started a new, and this is one of the, the strategic plan you mentioned, the two-year process that renamed the institution. One of the new areas we decided on four main areas. I'll just quickly say religion research will remain strong here. Our degree programs in interreligious and peace studies, our global and community partnerships. But the last pillar is entirely new to us and truthfully entirely new to the country in so many ways. There are very few people who do religious identity and, and wellness within the workplace. And so we started the fourth pillar or the fourth sphere here at the institution or at Hartford International, which will be executive and professional education. In some ways like the, you know, the, the, the Kennedy Business School of, of religious education and interreligious understanding. And so right now we have really, I can say more about them, but really important programs for, for executives, uh, for a large global insurance company that's help, you know, asked us to help them with, with religious identity and um, uh, religious questions in the workplace. How do I host this holiday party? It's like, oh, the dreaded December month. What do I do? You know, how do I handle this? Uh, you know, I, I don't really feel capable. It's a hard subject. Uh, and so we do some webinars and actually we do some consulting work that's customized to the needs of our, mm -hmm. of our companies in this country. Uh, really interesting thinking about how you're expanding your reach to boardrooms and nonprofits and hospitals. But Joel, for our listeners uh, right now who uh, we are in a workplace and may have discomfort um, asking uh, coworkers about their religious traditions or holidays. You know, what's uh, some advice that you can give them? How to begin? <laughs> it's great and great question. This this is now partly personal, but also things I've learned along the way. And you know, this, the, I'm a work in progress, just like everyone on on this earth. At least I hope we're all works in progress. Um, I've learned a lot from people like Ibu Patel. Um, uh, founder of Interfaith Youth Corps, uh, people like uh, Joseph Telushkin, Rabbi Joseph Telushkin, his word, his book called Words That Hurt, Words That Heal. I shouldn't promote books, but I'm just mentioning books that have been really influential in my life. Um, Ibu, Ibu talks a lot about this idea of, of, or I think I've kind of interpreted some of his work as, you know, that interpret or that, sorry, um, appreciative curiosity. Um, I think that when questions come from a place of sincere appreciation, when they're asked carefully, after friendships are formed, um, you know, I noticed that 
you know, you know I, I think you might have done it. You know, you can, you, there, there are ways to ask questions that I think show respect, but also an appreciation. You know, find something, as, as Jalushka would say, find something to appreciate in your host. Um, find something to, to praise in them. Um, it just makes us better people anyway, regardless of DEI discussions. But just, you know, are we, you know, there's a sense of gratitude, being thankful for our coworkers, thanking them for things they've done. Um, you know, there are ways to get to these questions without having to be quite so um, uh, intent or deliberate about them. I think the, the hard spaces is because um, so often religion, especially Christianity is associated with conversion and sort of proselytization to use that technical term, but the idea that you might convert someone to be uh, become part of your own religious team or something, those questions get, or it, it can be very tricky in the workplace. And, you know, I can just say I'm very comfortable in my own, in my own space. I don't want that to be a condition of our friendship. I'd like to learn more about what, what, what's important to you. What do you really value? And sometimes when you ask those questions, you can get into the religious discussions or the spiritual life that people try to live out or attempting to live out. It's going to be different for every person, even within a tradition. Of course, we try not to make assumptions about, oh, you're Christian, therefore you believe X, or you're Muslim, you must do this. Uh, you're Jewish, therefore you, you know, there's a variety of ways that people live out their religious lives and their spiritual lives and not making assumptions. I think that's my second piece of advice. The appreciative curiosity would be the first. And then the second would be, you know, good interfaith work or good dialogue, good work in this area is about not making assumptions. You know, just don't make an assumption about the person across from you. Um, try to learn something about that individual as an individual before you kind of peg them as something um, based on an assumption about religion. Mm. You're hearing Joel Lohr here on Where We Live. He's president of Hartford International University for Religion and Peace, formerly known as Hartford Seminary. As we talk and learn about this longtime institution in our state and how it's growing and changing to reflect a, a, a different mission from the time that it first began back into the 1830s. Coming up, we're going to hear from more faculty and a student. You can join us as well. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at where we live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We're learning about a longtime institution in our state that recently changed its name to reflect a growing mission. Hartford Seminary is now the Hartford International University for Religion and Peace, the outgrowth of a strategic plan that began a few years ago. Coming up, we'll hear from a current student in the university's inaugural peace building program. Joining us now on Zoom is Ida Mansour, Director of Field Education at Hartford International University. Ida, welcome. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be with you. And another faculty member, Dina Grant, Associate Professor of Jewish Studies at the University. Dina, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. Now, Ida, I wanted to start with you. You're also a chaplain. And so what drew you to study at Hartford International University? So um, in 2001, after 9-11, um, it, it came to my attention that we really needed dialogue. Um, there was a lot of um, misinformation about Islam and Muslims, and I wanted to learn more about how I could uh, dialogue with my uh, fellow Abrahamic uh, partners in this world. Um, and so Hartford Seminary now, of course, HIU, um, did that. It provided a safe space to do that. And so I enrolled. Um, I took a few courses initially and then got drawn in. Um, um, the chaplaincy program began in 2001 with Dr. Ingrid Matson. Um, and what I was really interested in, in in chaplaincy is, you know, sort of when people think of the word chaplaincy, uh, as you mentioned before, people usually think of, uh, you know, it being a Christian word. And so this idea of Islamic chaplaincy really drew me in. Um, as you know, uh, a chaplain provides support uh, and professional compassionate pre presence to many, um, whether they are religious or not religious. And, and that really um, you know, sort of uh, drew, drew me in, uh, in, in ways. And we, I mean, we started the Islamic Chaplaincy Program 20 years ago now. Um, and with each year we try to or aim to get more intentional. Um, and so the aim is really in our, in, at HIA, the aim is to provide the nation with 
qualified, uh, knowledgeable and professional and compassionate chaplains. And so uh, with each year, we're, we're trying a little bit more uh, to do that. You mentioned uh, the period after 9-11, and I, was, mm -hmm. I wanted to hear more about uh, your experiences as a Muslim woman when you said that you sought out a place like Hartford International University because you realized there needs to be more dialogue, more understanding about different mm -hmm. faiths and cultures. So what did you experience, Ida? So um, about four days after 9-11, um, there, there was a kill, um, you know, a, a Sikh gentleman was shot. Um, and when that happened, just for looking foreign, and when that happened, uh, the Imam of uh, our mosque in Hartford, Imam Qasim, who has passed away, um, he called everybody who wore the headscarf. And he told us all to stay home, um, not to go out, uh, because he was fearing for our lives. Because wearing a headscarf, you're recognized as something foreign. And so uh, in Connecticut, many women, um, you know, stayed home. Our, our full-time Islamic school was closed for, uh, you know, quite a few months uh, after 9-11. And there was this just intense fear of backlash against our community. Uh, we were actually, you know, at the point where we were mourning uh, the fact that our, our, our nation had been attacked, but also we were, we were mourning the fact that we were being associated with the crime. And so it was, you know, a double, you know, it, it, it was it was doubly hurtful to our community. Um, and so, you know, we were staying in and I had one uh, circumstance where I had to, you know, go to the um, grocery store to get milk. And I remember going, uh, you know, sort of uh, and, and realizing this is like three or four days after 9-11, um, you know, feeling this sense of, um, uh, you know, sort of guilt by association, as it were. And what happened to me was very interesting. I, I, I um, you know, was on, on the way to getting these two gallons of milk. And this woman um, who I was, you know, sort of who was in my vision was looking at me really intently. Um, and she she kind of walked towards me. And I and I, you know, thinking that she was going to attack me, I was right, really nervous. Mm -hmm. uh, but she came and she gave me a hug. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, I am in this store shopping for my Muslim neighbor. And if you want anything, just let me know. And, and that really hit home to me. This is a person who wasn't Muslim, who knew Muslims. Uh, and, I, and, it real, and it made me realize the importance of reaching out to building bridges in community. Um, and what was so beautiful about that was that Hartford Seminary, now HIU, um, did just that. Um, it, provided a, it, it provides us with a safe space. Um, for spiritual connection. And I have to say, you know, I'm happy that Dina's also here. Um, we're able to have these conversations. You know, Dina is Jewish, I am Muslim. And it's such a, 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 a beautiful thing to have conversations based on friendship and trust. Um, so, yeah. What a beautiful story that you shared with us, Ida. You mentioned uh, your colleague, uh, Dina, also with us on Zoom. So, Dina, tell me about uh, how you gravitated towards Hartford International and some of the, the conversations that you have with students. Yeah, um, sure. Well, one of the things that, that um, made me interested in HIU is going back to my childhood, I grew up in a traditional Jewish house in Miami. And in my neighborhood, I could pretty much point to any house whose household was Orthodox Jewish and tell you all about them, who they are, where they go to synagogue, where they send their kids to school, who are their friends, even, you know, who they're having over for dinner. But for those houses in my neighborhood that were not Orthodox, they remained completely anonymous to me. I knew everything about houses A, B, and C, but, but really nothing about houses D, E, and F. And it just seemed so odd that my familiarity with people was so circumscribed by religious community. And I was curious, I was curious about religious communities. And so fast forward to, you know, learning about HIU and learning that the focus of HIU is in part on dialogue among people of different faiths and, and among people with very opposing viewpoints, uh, helping them live and be in community and work productively together to affect change, I found that, you know, very, very attractive. And the conversations that you have with students today, Dina? Actually, um, something interesting, because Ida's here with us, uh, part of what we do here is, is we try to model 
um, interreligious dialogue. Uh, because dialogue is not easy. You know, it's easy to talk about things that people agree on, but, you know, it's not easy to talk about things that people strongly disagree, especially when it relates to ethics and beliefs. And, you know, I'll give a, a personal example uh, uh, with me and Ida that I think we can now model for our students. I hope that's okay, Ida. Um, Perfectly fine, Dina. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, so Ida is a very good friend of mine, and we've been friends for a few years now, yet we have very opposing views of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. You know, I, th I and I think we were wary about, wary of this about each other. Mm -hmm. And for a while, we kind of just stayed away from the topic, probably rightfully so. Um, but we're friends, and friends like to get closer. Um, and this issue is, you know, close to both of our hearts. I have family that lives in Israel and a nephew going into the army next year. Um, and Ida's had some very difficult and painful experience as a Muslim traveling there. Um, and since we're friends, we wanted to feel more visible to one another. So we decided to engage in uh, dialogue. Um, Phoebe Milliken, who is the director of our Masters in Peace Building, facilitated for us a kind of scripted dialogue. And, and we engaged, we knew it would be difficult. And I won't go into the, the specific details of our personal opinions, but I'll just say the experience was both tough and gratifying. Um, you know, there were moments of anger and frustration on both of our parts, but, and ultimately neither of us changed our fundamental perspectives intellectually, but we knew coming in that that's not what we were there for. We were learning about and engaging in dialogue. There's not going to be a winner or a loser. This was, you know, dialogue and not debate. And we, having engaged that in that, we can help model it uh, to our students. Um, and, and I'll just add what, what we also gain from this and what I think students gain from these activities is not only the friendship, but the kind of sensitivity and empathy that uh, you then bring back to your own religious communities. And so the, the growth in the area of interreligious peace building can become exponential at, um, through practices such as these, which we do here at mm -hmm. HIU. That kind of conversation, the need for understanding and learning to listen, uh, something that transcends um, and goes to what is at the heart of our society today, Dina. Uh, a lot of division uh, based on on politics and uh, beliefs. Uh, I'm wondering, Ida, if you can add to what Dina shared about sure. that kind of conversation and the conversations you're having with students who are coming to your university to learn how to have these kinds of uh, conversations. Yeah, what that what that dialogue, that particular dialogue, taught me was it's so important to have a safe space to be able to speak and having a relationship beforehand uh, where you have trust, where you have a friendship is really key. And I think it, it takes time to build those relationships and, and, and build up that trust, but it is possible. And, and I think it's so valuable um, to speak as well as to be heard and validated. And I think that's, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I really feel so, um, uh, so so uh, privileged um, to be in this institution, which gives us that safe space uh, to do that. And I and I think um, we try and you know sort of uh, teach this to our students. Um, you know, uh, uh, Fatma will be speaking soon, and she's a MAP student. She lives um, you know on on campus with ten other students, and you'll, and you'll hear more about that. But getting to know people that you've never you know, thought of being, you know, completely outside your comfort zone is is so vital and, and so, so important. Mm. Uh, we were talking about uh, difference of opinions of Israel and Palestine, but I'm thinking mm. about some of the students who come to you and your other faculty. They are living in these areas of conflict and tension. And so I'm wondering, if, Ida, if you can talk more about you know how uh, this can be difficult uh, for us we can we can talk about it we're removed from it for the most part but for people who are studying and they go back into these communities when this this tension this conflict is very real um right. how they're able to work through that so um in, and and Fatma will be able to speak more about that but i you know as, as i see it 
it's just so so vital that they have that chance to see how it can be modeled. Um, many of our students, you know, when they, you know, sort of come from very, very sensitive areas where there's a lot of violence involved. And so this, uh, so HIU creates that safe space um, where we can, we can sort of look at the process and, and, and process our thoughts and, and, and what triggers us. And, and we have time to do that. Um, in, in, in places where there's intense war, et cetera, people have not, you know, don't have the time to do that. And so this gives them space and time to process you know, what they're going through and, and, and what, what their triggers are and, and how they can build a more successful you know, sort of way of dialogue. Mm. Uh, Joel Lohr is still with us. He's president of Hartford International University. So Joel, talk about um, not just the name change, as we would already learned, but uh, when we think about some of these new programs that your institution uh, has started, including the peace building program we've mentioned a few times, uh, talk through um, more about this program. Sure, thank you. Um, so the International uh, the Master of Arts in International Peace Building grew out of a program that was a certificate program that was started in 2004. I mentioned my predecessor Heidi Hadsell started this program with the gifts of a few other, uh, a few donors who really thought this was an important uh, development for what we did or what we were doing. And um, the beauty of this program, and so it's still a fairly small cohort, it's grown a little bit. We tended to have between four to seven students each year come in and live together, learn together. They would take classes in our master's program, but they, they would end up with a certificate. It was a one-year program. And we started looking at the country, actually it was our creditors that looked to us and, and you know, they, they've asked, sometimes we're called upon for expertise when it comes to interreligious understanding, but they also talked to us about um, we were talking about this certificate program, transforming it into a master's program. We really wanted to keep it fully funded. So just so you know, it's a fully funded program and we, we rely on donors each year to fund it, which is, is part of my work to, to try to raise the, the support for this important program. And so students come here on full tuition. They have their flights covered from anywhere in the world, South Africa this year, uh, Pakistan, you live from Fatma, um, Indonesian student this year. We have you know students from all over. So they come full tuition, full travel. They have living expenses covered here. We provide housing, we provide healthcare and books and food. Um, it's it's a lot to put on, but we really believe in in this this idea that people should be able to come here from around the world and not have financial um, you know finances as a barrier. And so this program was transformed into a master's degree. And our creditors looked to us and said, you know, this program is an important program. Have you looked at other models of masters in our country? Not necessarily the sort of religion research, um, you know, academic masters, but something that blends the the rigor of academic study of religion with the the very practical diplomacy skills and human rights skills and uh, discussion and dialogue skills that are so important in our world. And so we did so as a professional degree. It's a one-year degree, the first of its kind in our country. We like to be trailblazing. We start the first Islamic chaplaincy program in the in the country. And we really think this is an important program that focuses, not the first to do peace building, but the first that focuses specifically on religion, uh, inter-religious understanding as the key to, to really bring about meaningful peace in our world. And so students come for a full year. It's a full year. They can do in 16 months, 12 to 16 months with a capstone project in their home country. And we'll hear from one of the students in this peace building program right after a short break. You're listening to Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today we've been learning about a pioneering theological university in our state located in Hartford's West End, once called Hartford Seminary, now the Hartford International University for Religion and Peace. Uh, with us on Zoom is its president, Joel Lohr, and faculty members, Ida Mansour, and uh, also Dina Grant. But I wanted to hear uh, a student perspective. Uh, Fatima Basharat joins us now. She's a student in the inaugural MA International National Peace Building Program that we heard about. Fatima, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you. Nice to be here. 
So originally you were from Pakistan. So tell us uh, what brought you to study at Hartford International University and a little bit more about the peace building program that you're involved in. Um, sure. I am from Pakistan and I've, um, I studied comparative religions as my graduate program and uh, living in Pakistan, like we don't have um, like different people from different religions, like uh, because it's a uh, it's a Muslim majority country, but we can see uh, divisions among uh, Shia Muslims and Sunni Muslims and constant fight between them. Uh, and there is a constant struggle to create peace between them. And uh, also, I was very, very curious about transgender roles in Pakistan. And uh, I was, uh, I really wanted to work on these things. And uh, uh, that's also one of my, like, that that would be my capstone project, uh, hopefully. So uh, I thought that uh, this would be uh, a nice place to get um, to get some skills on peace building and uh, bring those uh, skills to Pakistan and uh, yeah and so Fatima tell me more about uh, you mentioned your capstone project looking at transgender uh, rights in Pakistan and how this is uh, you know how this brings uh, conflict uh, how they're treated uh, in in Pakistan can you tell us more about that Sure. Um, so uh, the transgender community uh, is like in a very bad situation there. Uh, they, right, their rights are violated completely. And uh, I don't think that like they're treated very humanely there. Uh, uh, people don't accept them as a religion, like in their mosques or even in their education, like uh, to the schools as well. So mostly when a family realizes that their child is a transgender, so they usually kick them out of their homes and usually the transgender community is, are homeless in Pakistan. And since no one accepts them, they don't get a decent job. They don't get a decent education as well to get a decent job. So it's like kind of sad. So, and also the reaction uh, of people towards uh, those communities is like, um, it's like very, it's not good and it's been like terrifying. Um, it was just like um, recently I heard the news that uh, there was a party going on. Like, I don't know, they were celebrating something, a transgender party. But there were some men who just were standing there and they, uh, you know, tried to assault them. And it's like it's very sad and no one actually speaks about those community. Uh, 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 and those people. So, um, yeah, like that's what makes me very sad about it. And so but, when you, uh, when you return to Pakistan, how do you hope to help? And is this something that uh, also brings risk to yourself, uh, Fatima for, uh, you know, wanting to help this particular community? Uh, yeah, I actually, um, there are risks. I'm actually very not quite sure that how things would work, but because that would be my capstone project uh, and I would be working with my advisor soon on these things. Um, so like my plan is to work with some organizations like there. It's not that no one works for them. Like there is a small amount of work done for transgender community, but it's not like you know, up to the mark or people just do something and then leave it. And I just wanted to be to bring a con consistent change for those people. Um, maybe uh, working with an organization or some influencers in Pakistan and uh, interviewing uh, those communities. And I'm just trying to use an ar use art uh, or uh, media as because I believe that they have a very strong impact on human being, like people's mind and they can actually transform people and their thinking. So I actually wanted to interview some people, some of those communities and maybe make a documentary or about their lives or maybe, um, you know, make a short film about their lives and uh, how they feel um, so that people may realize what they feel and also 
working with an organization to give them more job opportunities and um, uh, more educational opportunities. So that's my plan. And that's my, I, I, it's just like, right now things are very abstract for me, but I hope that they become like the, yeah, they become very practical soon. So, yeah. Oh, we just have a couple of minutes left. Uh, Ida Mansour, yeah. I wanted to ask you, Ida, your response to hearing about Fatima's plans and how this goes along with the university's mission of peace building. I truly think it's it's so commendable. Um, this is a, a population that are going through so much strife. Um, and, and I think, you know, sort of learning about, um, you know, transgender and, and, and how, you know, sort of... Um, Religions tend, to, you know, sort of people who, who uh, claim to be a specific religion tend to judge when we're not supposed to be uh, judging anybody. I think it's, it's it's vital to have conversations around that, and so I'm looking forward to reading uh, Fatima's project immensely. <laughs> And Joe Lohr, again, you're still with us. Uh, when we think about uh, also studying uh, trauma in communities and what uh, uh, leads to stigma and prejudice. Again, this is something that uh, Hartford International University hopes to combat. Absolutely. I mean, Fatma is one of so many amazing examples. We could talk to you about stories from Nigeria, um, students who come here with one perspective and leave with a new one, even if they remain committed to a certain way of looking at life and values, but that they have these experiences with each other that that um, help them deal with their own trauma. I can think of a Nigerian student in particular who was here last year and some of the things that he's witnessed in his life, some of the things he can't erase from his memory. Um, telling the story of, of, of taking a young child and adopting that child into his home because he, he pulled the child off its mother's breast as, as his mother lied dead in the in this village that had been that had been uh, massacred and uh, so the trauma that our students have been through these are students that I just you know we we claim to be the teachers but we learn from them um, we share their grief but also their joys we learn from them about joy and, and happiness. Uh, as you can probably gather from just meeting Fatma, from uh, a Muslim from Pakistan, uh, there's so many beautiful stories that I get to be part of. I invite people to be part of these stories and, and learn more about us. Take a class with us and rub shoulders with our students. Audit a class, not to promote us too much, but just to say this is a unique and special place right here in Hartford that so many people don't know about. Well, Joe Lohr, thank you so much for coming on the show, explaining to us about uh, the, the mission of Hartford International University for Religion and Peace, formerly the Hartford Seminary. Thank you for your time today, Joel. Thank you so much. And also with us, we heard from Fatima Basharat, a student in the inaugural MA in International Peace Building Program, as well as other faculty, Ida Mansour and Dina Grant. Thank you for your t time today on today's show. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel, uh, produced by uh, Test Terrible with help from Katie Pellico and Katie Tolarski today. Our technical producer is Kat Pastor. We'll be back tomorrow.